So on that note, I'd like to welcome you, Peter, and say thank you for coming, and I apologize for that blank moment. <laughs> Thanks very much, Cedric, uh, and, the, and the committee for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, what I wanted to do um, this morning is to reflect on my passage from physics, the physics world, into the education world. And when I talk about the interaction of physics with uh, physics education research, I don't simply mean this community, but the, uh, the, the larger education world. As Cedric has mentioned, um, I started out in physics. Uh, my position in uh, the University of the Bartestrand in uh, Johannesburg uh, was in the physics department, but with responsibility for uh, educating physics teachers. And uh, it was during that period that uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, I wanted to be a science educator rather than a physicist. And, um, and then finally, uh, in 1985, moved to the University of Wisconsin in Madison into the science education area. And so I'll be drawing from um, my own experience with that in terms of looking at where did my physics background uh, stand me in good stead um, and where were the places where I needed to go beyond it. In terms of um, three cases, uh, that will illustrate different aspects of this. So the first one, uh, what I call worldview compatibility, is what does a physics worldview contribute to an understanding of student learning? Let's start with my doctorate. Um, charge exchange in nuclei following um, pion inelastic scattering. Uh, I don't want to talk about the content of that so much as the process uh, that one went through in terms of um, I came as a graduate student, um, found a problem in which um, there was existing theory which could not explain an experimental result, uh, proposed a theoretical model, uh, calculated the effects of that, compared it with the experiment and found that uh, there were reductions in that. So the, the, the process that one goes through, the steps there, uh, I think would be well known to all of you. Um, but I also wanted to use that as a means just to reflect a little bit more about what I mean by a, a physics worldview. Um, this is another page from uh, that, that paper uh, in which uh, the model was looking at an individual pion scattering of a carbon-12 nuclei um, and the, the sorts of interactions that happened. Uh, so it was an isolable system uh, with specified reactions and, uh, and representations of different sorts. Um, but more generally, there, there were other things embedded in that, that work, one of which was the generalizability, the fact that uh, the model was about an individual uh, pion and atom, uh, and yet, it, we could generalize it to the, uh, the experiment which was conducted with an empirical uh, beam of pions uh, on, uh, uh, on a target. Uh, cause and effect was clearly part of uh, that physics worldview, obviously in different sorts of ways, a clear relationship between experiment and theory. And the um, underlying sense of, of what happened in a, in a paper like that was a rational argument. Um, in which one was simply working uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the physics uh, and, and nothing else, even expressed in the third person type of language that one used in those sorts of papers. Um, the question that I became interested in is how do students learn complex structured content such as physics? That was uh, in the early years the, the, the driving question. And um, looking at education at the time, uh, the, the dominant uh, paradigm for research was a quantitative experimental uh, type of model. Um, and um, let me give you an example of that. This is from 1978, a paper by John Woolley, um, Factors Affecting Students' Attitudes and Achievement in an Astronomy Computer-Assisted Instruction Program. Uh, this, the steps of that, uh, you identify variables, 
uh, develop an intervention, use experimental and control groups, gather pre and post data, analyze with inferential statistics. And the, uh, that, that what happens when you do that sort of thing is that you can make empirical generalizations. Um, that the expectation is that you use the same intervention uh, with a different group of students, presumably um, like the ones in that particular class, uh, you could expect the similar sorts of results. Um, the one thing to note about it was that um, there's a black box over what happens between the pre and post uh, data. Um, and so assumptions made about how that all worked. Um, another type of research was becoming uh, uh, apparent at that stage was education, uh, at least was, was, was qualitative research. Um, and here's a paper uh, in the early 80s by John Clement, students' preconceptions in introductory mechanics, uh, in which he used data from uh, written tests and videotape problem-solving interviews with students uh, to analyze the content of that. Um, and uh, a conclusion of that is that the misconception that was revealed there is highly resistant to change and is remarkably similar to one discussed by Galileo. So the, the nature of the outcome of that, that sort of research is, yes, to talk about the process of what was going on and the way in which students were thinking about that, uh, and an indication, uh, I think, from that is that students uh, are active learners. They can develop arguments, uh, albeit not necessarily the arguments that uh, we as physicists would want, uh, that they are rational, they can give reasons for why this is the case. Um, and it leads to what I'll call a theoretical generalization. There's no claim that uh, because uh, Clement discovered this with the group of students that he's working with, that it could necessarily be the same case um, in, um, uh, in larger groups. But nevertheless, the possibility existed, and the implications of that were something that we needed to explore. Um, and constructivism, I think, was uh, a convenient way of thinking about that uh, at the time. What I wanted to say is that the type of worldview that I had from my physics experiment has a close affinity with constructivism. I think that Sally yesterday uh, said that it's, it's useful to look at what we learn from physics uh, in terms of how it applied there. It doesn't mean that it, uh, it's, um, it, it uh, transfers immediately, but because there are differences between physics and education, mostly uh, if we think about individual differences. Uh, we're all humans in this room, but we are different. Um, and we can't simply assume that ready generaliza generalizability uh, that we can in the physics world. Uh, another thing is in terms of teaching and learning, uh, there, there's an easy assumption that maybe teaching and learning is a cause-effect relationship. I teach, therefore people learn. Uh, <laughs> there's an ontological relationship. Teaching that has no intention that people will learn uh, is not what I would call teaching. Um, and so it raises the question that perhaps uh, we need to rethink what teaching is and perhaps um, facilitation is one way to go. Um, I'd also want to, th uh, the second thing is, is to think about the contribution uh, of an analogy uh, to, uh, from drawn uh, from physics uh, and how that influenced um, uh, education. Is student learning analogous to the growth of disciplinary and scientists' knowledge? Um, and if we think about this notion of growth, um, perhaps one of the, uh, the largest um, and most well-known statements is Newton's uh, statement of, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the, soldier, uh, the, the shoulders of giants. Uh, that's a progressive view. Uh, uh, an ever upward view, uh, a building view. Uh, another sort of a metaphor that comes to mind uh, is the sorts of pyramids that water skiing teams build as, uh, uh, as they climb on, on shoulders and maybe up to about three levels or something like that. It's, uh, it's a progressive ever upward sort of a view. Um, what I want to do is uh, refer to uh, a very well-known paper uh, 
that uh, raises questions about that. And this is um, Einstein's special theory of relativity. 1905 is in, in his um, Annus Mirabilis, and this is a picture of him as a, as a patent officer. And the structure of that paper is interesting because it starts with an anomaly. Um, and he's interested in uh, electromagnetic induction, um, the interaction of uh, a coil and a magnet that are moved relative to one another. And what Einstein noted was that if we consider the coil to be at rest, then we have a changing magnetic field, uh, and there were explanations for that. If we consider the magnet to be at rest, then we have a changing electric field, and there are theories uh, to explain that. But what concerned Einstein was that those were different explanations. And his epistemology was that if we have the same phenomenon, we should not have different theories. Uh, and so he used that as a powerful tool to think through what do I need to do in order to develop theory that would be the same for both of those explanations. Um, and the principles that he came with, uh, out with were uh, first, uh, the principle of relativity, there is no such thing as an absolute frame of reference. Um, and then another one that uh, uh, is in many ways counterintuitive, the fact of the speed of light uh, being constant regardless of frame of reference. Um, and on the basis of that he developed this theory um, and um, in particular it has other counterintuitive um, um, outcomes that, that are well known to us. Moving rods get shorter, moving clocks run slower. Um, we know what's um, said about that. So, um, in the 1950s, um, The Structure of Scientific Revolution was a book that, uh, that addressed this different way of thinking about um, how science progresses. Um, Thomas Kuhn uh, was uh, somebody whose doctorate was in physics and then became interested in why are scientific theories either accepted or rejected and um, in, um, in a, the sort of the simple way of saying is that there are two types of science. I mean that, that's, that's clearly a simplification but nevertheless there are two types of science. Normal science which is a, pu a, a puzzle-solving activity uh, conducted under a reigning paradigm. Quite clearly, my, uh, my doctoral dissertation was an example of that. Um, and then revolutionary science, in which an anomaly creates a crisis that leads to a paradigm shift. Uh, that clearly is an example. Uh, Einstein's paper is an example of that. Um, and um, this then led into this, this question that, that I started out. Is student learning analogous to the growth of disciplinary and scientists' knowledge? Um, and the pursuit of that led to this paper, uh, Accommodation of a Scientific Conception Toward a Theory of Conceptual Change. Uh, it came out of a collaboration that I had uh, on a sabbatical uh, in the middle of um, my first sabbatical from the physics department in, in Johannesburg, which I went to Cornell and uh, collaborated with George Posner, uh, a curriculum specialist with a background in physics, Ken Strike, who was an education philosopher, um, and then Bill Gertzog, who was a graduate student working on the project, in which we considered um, this particular question. Uh, and the paper uh, did um, two things. One of them was that it looked at the conditions for conceptual change. Um, this was drawn from a study of the, uh, the history and philosophy of science, um, in which uh, quite clearly Ken had a, a leading part in, in putting that together, uh, in which he, uh, he and then uh, within the paper, we identified four different conditions uh, under which conceptual ch change might happen. Um, let, let me say that uh, there's nothing um, unique or special or complete about these ones, but simply that uh, they became productive in, in helping us think about it. Um, 
The first condition is uh, what I refer to as the lowering of status of, uh, of current ideas dissatisfaction. Uh, there has to be some reason uh, if we have uh, a well-established theory, uh, either in physics or uh, in our own minds, uh, to consider something else seriously. Um, and then the different conditions that, that happen in terms of the raising of status of, of new ideas. Um, the first one is intelligibility. We can't really consider uh, anything if we don't understand what it is. Intelligibility means that we can give it meaning um, and um, we can understand uh, its content. Uh, the second thing is plausibility. Um, quite clearly, um, when we say moving clocks run slower, that's intelligible. Uh, we all know what that means. Whether we believe that's the case, whether we are convinced that that's the way the world works, whether that fits with other things that we know is what plausibility is all about. And to engage with plausibility, uh, what one in the end uh, needs to do is to be metacognitive about our own knowledge. Uh, to look at it and say, uh, uh, how, does that, how does that fit with other things? So plausibility is an extra stage uh, that comes after it. And then fruitfulness um, is uh, a condition that gives uh, reasons to carry on with it. Uh, what, are, what are the fruitfulnesses of that? And uh, it's useful at this particular point in time to reflect on the fruitfulness of Einstein's special theory of relativity that then led to the general theory of relativity and to the discovery of gravity waves in the last couple of years that has excited the physics community. So fruitfulness is important. Um, so those are the conditions of conceptual change. Um, and then we wanted to, uh, we did an empirical study in terms of investigating student understanding. Um, could we find evidence in, um, in interviews with students of, of these sorts of stages? Um, the work that we did this in was a, was a freshman, non-major physics course at uh, Cornell University. I was a, teaching a tutorial section there. Um, it was uh, a mastery learning type course, so there was plenty of opportunity for me to talk to, uh, uh, to students at different stages as they progressed through the course. And there was a, a unit on special relativity uh, that uh, considered um, the sorts of things that um, uh, are at the heart of that paper. Uh, and what I did was to conduct interviews with students in the section, my section, um, an available sample of students um, in, that was structured uh, to try to get evidence of uh, the extent to which students saw special relativity, uh, how did they make sense of it, find it intelligible, what about its plausibility. Um, and, and so, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the background to this um, was that, uh, back to that question, uh, is student learning analogous to the growth of disciplinians and scientists' knowledge? Uh, and I guess at that point we were somewhat skeptical. Uh, do students see anomalies? Do students have commitments about the nature of scientific knowledge or principles about the natural world? Uh, do students change their minds for rational reasons? Um, or for other sorts of reasons. And as I said, I think we were somewhat skeptical. Looking around at posters at this particular thing, I think that um, uh, one is much more likely to be optimistic about um, saying yes, positively, those things do occur. Um, let me give you one example from that paper uh, about a commitment to absolute space and time. Um, CP was um, a student who struggled in the early parts of that unit, uh, particularly the force and motion and understanding that um, she wouldn't have been the first to, do, uh, to find that difficult. Um, and when uh, looking at some of these implications, she said, yeah, I mean, absolute time, it just seems to go on at a certain rate everywhere. It just seems natural that it's constant everywhere. I mean, even though you see these results. So it seems these, I asked, it seems these are strange results. What attitude do you take of these results? And she said, I say they don't really mean all that much. It just depends on what your frame is. It's sort of like potential energy depends on the way you define zero to be. 
And I asked the amount of potential energy you've got, and she said, right, all relative to what's going on. Now, she's, ra she's rationalized why it is that she's not prepared to believe it. She doesn't find it, she finds it intelligible, she doesn't find it plausible, and she has a reason for doing so. Uh, we, we can criticize the reason clearly, uh, but clearly she's, she's reached into something else that she learned in this course uh, in terms of uh, and, and, and using that, and perhaps in fact interpreting relative in a different sort of a way as well. But nevertheless, uh, she's clearly thinking about it and uh, is willing to state that. So that analogy has been productive. Um, let's say that it's um, influenced our understanding of the types of intellectual work students can and do engage in. Um, for me, um, it was something that in many ways launched my career in science education um, and uh, led into studies of teaching and teacher education, professional development uh, and the like. And that paper has been cited more than five and a half thousand times and continues to be cited. Um, so clearly it struck some nerve at some point. Let me move on to the last case um, which I've called um, a worldview contrast. Why are methods of research treated so differently in physics and education? That's the question um, that came to me um, that led to a consideration um, of, of the following. Um, once again, going back to my doctoral thesis, uh, the research design, there was a problem. Uh, we constructed a model, uh, looked at its, um, calculated its implications, uh, and then compared the, uh, the result. Uh, as I uh, suggested, uh, that's something that I would imagine none of you find controversial or difficult. Uh, the one thing that I would note is that in the course of my uh, graduate study for that, there was no formal coursework on research design uh, and methods. There, there didn't seem to be any need for it, um, I guess. Um, um, in contrast, looking about my experiences with respect to uh, the world of education, um, my first meeting with that was um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, this physics education evaluation project was set up as a collaboration between uh, a visiting professor, Walter Westphal, in the, um, in the physics department and um, the faculty of the science education area uh, at the University of British Columbia, um, Walter Bolt and um, Harry Cannon in particular. And it led to uh, a wide-scale uh, investigation um, of that, of a, a a freshman non-major physics course uh, in which different people um, observed teaching, that's lectures, tutorials and labs, uh, interviews with teachers and students about uh, various aspects of um, their teachers goals uh, uh, and so on, uh, and then of course the tests and quest which, which are a part of any physics course uh, and questionnaires. So a wide range of different ways of gathering different sorts of data. Um, and then another example comes from my experience um, as a faculty member in science education at the UW in Madison. Um, and if we look at the curriculum uh, in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, uh, there is a requirement on coursework on research design um, and various types of methods that could be statistical or it could be qualitative, narrative, various sorts of ways in which uh, one conducts research um, and designs research and makes sure that what happens comes together in a coherent whole uh, working from the type of research question that you've got, whether you've got foundations for that in the literature, uh, how your methods are going to allow you to, to, uh, to answer that question uh, in the same way. Um, and then also if you look at the, the structure of a typical dissertation um, in which there's a chapter on theoretical frameworks um, and a literature review chapter and then a chapter on, on research methods. 
what are the research methods, what are the, uh, the techniques that one used, how did you gather the data, what did you do in order to analyze the data, how could you use that data in order to answer the question uh, that you'd address. The consistency that needed to come uh, when one was making selections uh, from a wide array of different sorts of things uh, that, that came together. Um, and it's, it's only in recent years that I've really uh, thought about the question of saying why the difference. What is it that leads to this uh, dramatic difference? And, and clearly, um, I'm not sure what's happening in physics departments these days uh, and whether it's any different from those when I, when I was doing my doctorate. Um, but these are some uh, reflections that have been influenced uh, um, largely with conversations with uh, a couple of groups in, um, in Madison, um, science education group uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and also another group at Edgewood College. Uh, and if we think about, first of all, the objects of study uh, in these two fields, uh, with respect to physics, uh, the objects of study for physics uh, come from the natural world. Uh, Physicists tend to look at these things in the simplest possible way. When physicists look at a tree, what they do is see an object with, uh, an, with distributed mass um, that is able to resist particular sorts of stresses and strains and hold particular types of loads. Uh, a simple view um, that, uh, uh, as I've said, is, is generalizable, but the point about it is that um, it allows us, as a physics community, to um, handle it in a sophisticated and complicated uh, and important ways. And it's perhaps no surprise that, uh, from that perspective, physics is really the first of the sciences, uh, simply because it chose to look at simple systems and handle them in ways that became increasingly com uh, uh, complex. Um, there's also uh, an assumption in there that uh, the, the universal, universality of what it is that physicists are looking at uh, uh, can be assumed. It doesn't matter whether we're doing an experiment in Sacramento or Santiago or Saigon. We expect to get precisely the same sort of result. In contrast, if we look at uh, what are the objects of study in education, it's humans um, and human systems. Um, and we know um, that these, that we are complex uh, in, in many different sorts of ways. We are rational beings, we are irrational beings. We have emotions uh, and motivations um, as well as a power of cognitive thought. Um, I've also spoken about the fact that there are individual differences um, as well. And perhaps one of the, the most important ones is that uh, humans respond uh, and respond in different ways at different times to what it is that they experience. Um, and that uh, the, the sorts of responses are, are clearly uh, tempered by context and culture and complexity in all sorts of ways. Um, so the uh, the. The, the question of what it is that we, we look at and what we study uh, in these two worlds uh, are in fact very different. If we look at the nature of the discipline, I've, I've alluded to this, that physics is, is deep, it's, uh, it's uh, the knowledge in physics is, is extremely complicated, sophisticated, very coherent, uh, the fields are tightly connected. If we make a change somewhere, we expect uh, to see uh, that it has it, uh, implications elsewhere. Uh, and what, and this is a surmise at this particular point, that when you have that sort of uh, architecture of the discipline uh, that um, has been around a long time, has been thought through, uh, that is tightly connected, there's less likely to be reflection on its deep roots. Uh, it's not to say it doesn't happen. Um, this is not a dichotomy in this particular thing, uh, but there's a tendency, I think, uh, to do that. Uh, 
education as a discipline um, is, uh, is a much younger uh, affair. Uh, it's very broad, it's, it's many layered, um, and um, one can expect that there are going to be multiple perspectives uh, that are present in that. Uh, another aspect of this is that um, educational systems um, and, uh, and people are loosely connected. Uh, one can push on one part of, of knowledge and not expect it to have much influence elsewhere, uh, always. Um, and, I, uh, and this is, this is my hypothesis, that, that that then leads to much more reflection on theoretical roots and the need to express those uh, in order to put together um, uh, something that, that is going to make uh, new knowledge that is uh, uh, is, is, is well based and, and argued. Um, and then I think that there is um, another aspect uh, of this uh, if we look at the community. Uh, simply because of the nature of the discipline, uh, physics is much more likely to be a, a, a single discipline with higher consensus within that community. Uh, and uh, that consensus uh, has advantages and, uh, and disadvantages as well. Uh, one of them is that under those sort of circumstances uh, it's more difficult to push the boundaries uh, and um, in education I think that it's, um, it's somewhat different. There are, are clearly multiple communities. Uh, there is uh, much likely to be a lower consensus across communities and so, uh, in that sense, it's easier to, uh, to push boundaries um, and into new areas and try different sorts of things. So, in, in conclusion, uh, here are some things uh, that, that I believe, for me, these cases have uh, illuminated. Uh, the case one uh, was for me to think that uh, learning physics is an active enterprise. Uh, that's the notion of, of constructivism. Yes, it tends to be um, an individual constructivism at that point. Um, case two, the one of uh, the analogy is that um, I think in learning physics uh, we can now make a statement that students reason with varied types of knowledge uh, and that this is important and powerful and needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, and I think for case three, this is, is perhaps more of a stretch, but certainly uh, in, in terms of building the argument from uh, just simply looking at research methods, uh, that uh, what we've learned is that social interactions within communities uh, facilitate physics learning and the value of students accorded. Uh, and so that uh, leads into um, a different set of theories of social constructivism um, and critical theory uh, in terms of whether the systems are, are doing the sorts of things uh, that we really wanted to do. Um, I think it's, uh, it leads me to um, the sense of, of being sure to, to look at the learning of physics as something that, yes, physics that students do for themselves uh, that the outcome of what we want is that they would make uh, the physics their own. It's not uh, it's just something that was stated by dead white guys, but something that is relevant to me at, at this particular point. Uh, and that the, the social settings, people that we interact with, the communities in which we are involved, uh, are critically important in making that happen or not. Uh, I'd like to conclude um, with a conversation uh, I had uh, with the head of my department in Johannesburg, Frank Nabarro, an eminent solid state physicist, when I told him that when my sabbatical came that I was going to study education. Um, and he said physics problems are straightforward self-contained, well-defined, solvable. Education problems, on the other hand, are complex, sprawling, ill-defined, and difficult to solve. 
And then he said, but education problems are probably more important. And I agree with that. Thank you very much.